Welcome everybody to our uh, toy chat. Uh, once again, we've got a great turnout. And uh, this week uh, we've got a very uh, special program, uh, which is uh, from uh, the Erdl Company. And uh, our presenter tonight, Bill Walters, has been uh, with the company now 27 years. And I think I've worked with him pretty near all those years because <laughs> I remember when he was new to the company. And uh, back in those days, uh, Erdl had uh, toy collector focus groups of which I was one of the members from time to time where we would uh, get together and meet and uh, talk about uh, the replicas they were thinking of doing or not thinking of doing. And, and uh, so I got to know Bill fairly well through the years. And then uh, things uh, changed after the Erdl family sold out and Racing Champions was there. And um, uh, Tommy took over. So I'm sure Bill will fill us in a little bit on that. We know the Ertl history, but maybe some of you don't know the, the recent history in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. So maybe Bill will share that. And I know that Bill's also uh, very open to receiving your, your uh, input and your feedback on not only the current products that they're doing, but if you've got anything on your wish list, uh, I'm sure Bill will make notes of it for future consideration. So it's a good opportunity also for Bill to hear from the grassroots collectors. So uh, uh, Bill, we're so happy that you're taking your personal time tonight to meet with us. I know uh, it was a bit of a time that it took to get the date that would work at both ends. So we yep. do appreciate the time uh, for you to be with us tonight and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Well, I don't have a very long presentation. I know no one wants to sit two hours and hear me talk about uh, about everything, but uh, I will I will share this, and um, we'll try we'll take you through it, and then I've got you know just a slide at the end where we can open it up, and I'm happy to to uh, answer any questions or you know try to if you if you do have suggestions for us, we're always open to that. So thanks again for having me. Uh, again, I'm Bill Walters. I'm the senior vice president, and I'm in charge of what we call internally our ag and vehicle team. So I'm pretty much responsible for the Ertl brand and the vehicle lines that fall under that. So we not only do the diecast replicas uh, for the collectors, but obviously we do a lot of the plastic toy product as well that you see at Walmart and other farm stores. So just a little bit about me. I grew up just about 20, 25 miles north of Dyersville on the family farm. Our farm's been uh, in our family for over 100 years. Um, so it's, it's not a huge farm by any means. It was about 150 acres. Only about half of that is tillable. The other was pasture land, and there's also some rocky timber land on there as well. So that's, uh, that's where I grew up and obviously helped my dad on the farm. We also helped farm one of uh, my uncle's farms. So we did that as well. And so that's kind of where I you know, grew up. I also, my parents um, had uh, essentially two families. They had two girls, waited 16 years and then had two more kids and I'm the baby. So actually when I was born, I had a sister that was old enough that actually worked at the Ertl company as well in Dyersville. So when I was young, I got a lot of Ertl toys just from uh, an older sister bringing them home. So that's kind of the, the first memories I have were Ertl farm toys and playing with them in the farm. So we'll get on here with the presentation. If I can get my computer to work here. So obviously the Ertl brand is currently owned by Tomy. Tomy is one of the largest toy companies in the world. They're headquartered in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, probably the three largest toy companies are Mattel, Hasbro, and Lego. And we come in roughly fourth. Uh, this year, we're pegged to do right around $1.4 billion in toys. Obviously, a lot of that business um, is done in Asia with Tomy being headquartered in Japan. But we do do some really good business here in North America. And it's obviously not just farm toys. There's all kinds of products that Tomy does, whether it's in Asia, um, obviously as a global company in Europe, 
in Australia, North America, South America as well. When you talk about the farm brands, we primarily sell our products under two major brands. I'm sure you know about the Ertl brand, but then we also own the Britain's brand, which is primarily sold in Europe. So Britain's has been around a long time. Uh, the William Britain's company actually started in the late 1800s doing the little 132nd scale like military figures. They didn't really get into the farm products um, until like around about 100 years ago, they started doing some animals, uh, actually some basic implements. I believe their first farm tractor, which was a Fordson, came out right after World War II was over around 1948. So they're actually celebrating 100th anniversary of doing some of their first um, farm type uh, animals and vehicles this year in, in 2021. So I'm not only responsible for Ertl, I also work with our team in Europe. Um, and we try to obviously bring out products that we can sell globally. So we work with the licenses and work with each other to try to come out with products, obviously, that, that we can sell everywhere and that makes sense. I'm sure most of you know about the Ertl Company and the founding back in 1945. Obviously, we celebrated the 75th anniversary last year. It was, you know, not the greatest time to try to celebrate a 75th anniversary with everything that went on in 2020. But we did have, you know, we, we tried to celebrate and, and we're still kind of celebrating this year as well. So we're just doing the, the 75 plus one anniversary there. The Ertl Company obviously was acquired and, and has changed names several times over the years. We've also acquired companies along the way. I started again, as Doug said, in 1993. So I saw the big acquisition in 1999 when Racing Champions purchased Ertl. Obviously, Racing Champions was a diecast company that was doing mostly NASCAR diecast. And they acquired Ertl because our company, U.S. Industries, was kind of getting out of uh, what they considered consumer products. USI owned a lot of different companies, um, Tommy Armour Golf, Jacuzzi. There were lots of companies under the USI umbrella. They wanted to get rid of most of those. So Racing, Champion, Racing Champions acquired us in 1999. And they kept doing acquisitions as well. In 2003, they acquired a company called Learning Curve that did a lot of preschool products. So when that happened, we changed our name to RC2 versus Racing Champions Ertl. Then we acquired another company called The First Years that did infant baby type products. So, so that kept us busy up until 2011 when Tomi was looking to expand really beyond their core base, which was in, in Japan, Asia, as well as Europe. They wanted to get into more of the North America business. So Tomi purchased us outright. So we've been now um, part of Tomi for 10 years. And then just last year, uh, we purchased uh, through Tomi a company called Fat Brain Toys. This is a company um, headquartered in uh, Nebraska, in Omaha. And they do a lot of uh, toy products as well, primarily preschool products. And most of that is sold on their website, fatbraintoys.com. So, so it's been interesting as we try to kind of uh, make that all work together. Um, obviously, they're not too far away when you think about Omaha, Nebraska to, to Dyersville. And, and obviously, our corporate offices for Tomi in North America are in the suburb of Chicago. So we're all pretty much close here in the Midwest. Um, it was a little harder to get everything done with um, with COVID and, and all of that, but um, this this is a work in progress as we try to, you know, pull fat brain toys into the into the Tomi uh, company. So we also have a history of long term partnerships and licenses. Um, Obviously, one of the first licensed products we did was with John Deere. That started in 1946. 
at that time, Ertl was primarily the manufacturing side of it. And there was a company called ESCA that did more of the marketing side of things. So in conjunction with ESCA, we were able to get a license with John Deere and start producing product. Over the years, obviously, as we bought other companies, then we got other licenses with it, or we just went out and tried to get other licenses. So you can see some of the early ones with Ford. It took us till 1955 to get one with IH. I believe one of our first tractors was the Farmall 400 with them that came out in the mid 1950s. Also uh, licensed with Caterpillar in 1960. And then you can see some of the other licenses here over the years. So, so Ertl, you know, has tried to, you know, get these key farm and agricultural licenses and, you know, have really worked with them in a partnership to come out with product to, that really replicates their items and really showcases the new product that they have coming out. So I just wanted to put a slide up and just talk a little bit about, you know, all of the current licenses that we have. This isn't all of them, but uh, these are, you know, probably more of the, the more prominent ones in our, you know, in our portfolio right now. Obviously, as you saw on the last slide between John Deere Case IH now versus IH, um, Case Construction as well, New Holland. That also includes Agco, Alice Chalmers, you know, Hagee. Um, we also have a license with the National FFA. So we do some FFA based units. We also have, you know, you see a lot of pickup trucks and, and other larger trucks in the in farm world. So we try to have those licenses as well, whether it's Ram or Ford or GM, also Peterbilt and Freightliner. Um, we've included some additional licenses here uh, recently uh, with JCB, which we've had in Europe for a while, but we brought that into North America. Jeep, we're going to be doing a few Jeep items here going forward. We also have the versatile license. We don't have anything out in the marketplace right now, but we're working on that. So we've had versatile now for a few years. And two of the newest licenses I throw it up top here with Bobcat and Kloss. So we are tooling some new Bobcat items. We were able to get that license last year. Um, obviously with everything that was going on last year, um, it, it's taken us a little while to get all of that going. And the Kloss license as well, that's a global license. So we've, uh, we're bringing some products out in both Europe and North America. First, starting out with a 30-second scale, the Kloss Zerion 5000 tractor. We'll also be doing that in 64 scale as well. So again, quite a few licenses. Um, obviously, it keeps us busy <laughs> trying, to, trying to work on all this. Um, I, I spend quite a bit of time obviously working with all these licenses, um, not only getting new product approved, but uh, working with the marketing managers and the parts people with all of these licenses to be able to sell product to the dealerships and then also get approvals to sell those outside of the dealership. Well, you know, we, we do a lot of business with the actual dealerships, whether it's John Deere or Case H or New Holland, but we also do quite a bit of business with what we consider to be the farm retail channel. So whether it's the tractor supplies of the world or the farm and fleets, um, that that's good business with us, but it does obviously take a lot of time to make all of that work, make it all happen. So, you know, that obviously with all of these plus many more, it's pretty much a full-time job in and of itself, just to kind of keep everything up to speed. You know, it's, Anytime you get lawyers involved, it makes life interesting. And so we spend a lot of time making sure we've got all the contracts correct and and up to date. And that we don't, you know, obviously do something that the licensor doesn't want us to do. Obviously, we work with a lot of them up front as they're working on new products. We want to try to get our toy out as soon as we can after it's announced by the OEM. But we obviously don't want to get ahead of them and announce anything before they actually come out with a real one. So there is a lot of work on, on timing and getting approvals for everything as we work on a new project. 
Sometimes we need to get three or four different approvals at different stages along the path of the of the product, just to make sure and, and cover all of the legal basis before we can, you know, ship that product out, not only on the product, but on the packaging as well and the graphics. So, you know, it typically takes us, depending on the complexity of an item, anywhere from 10 months to sometimes 15 to 18 months to, to go from start to finish. There are a lot of steps involved, whether it is getting approval from the manufacturer, whether getting our tooling approved through Japan, trying to explain to them what we're trying to do, and then uh, obviously working through all the steps of getting the data. If it's, if it's a modern item, we try to get the actual engineering drawings from the manufacturer so we can work off of that. That doesn't work so well with vintage items because a lot of times there are no engineering drawings. So then we have to actually track down uh, an actual unit, photograph it, measure it, try to figure out you know if it's, if it's complete, if it's been modified or changed, uh, and just try to figure out what it would look like when it comes out of the factory or the configuration that the manufacturer wants it to be in. So it is a lot of work just to, to kind of get these from start to finish. Our three major licenses here, um, I showed you these are the covers of our catalogs for 2021. The other reason I put this up was I wanted to just give you a quick comment here. The barn that you see in the background is the barn on our family farm. So we actually went out to the farm, found a nice day and actually used those as backdrops. The New Holland uh, catalog cover, that was actually a grain bin we have on the farm. So we used it as a backdrop. So something a little fun and different. Uh, and, and, you know, kind of kind of pulled in to me, you know, the, the home place and we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of that barn last year. It was built by my grandfather and my uncles in 1920. So it was really a good time to kind of do it and, and have some fun with it. So I just wanted to touch on a, on a few new items that we have coming out. I tried to pick some from kind of the three major scales that we do, obviously 1 16th scale. 132nd scale, 164 scale. Some new items that we've already announced up on the top, um, the two cylinder club is doing a 4440 high crop with a four post wraps. So something a little unique and different. Um, we've, we, don't, we don't typically do too many high crops. Um, so it was interesting to do this. It's also the next one is a 1066 that we did for Red Power Roundup this year. It's the 50th anniversary of the 66 series tractors. So we wanted to do something a little different. We, we really haven't done too many narrow front 66 series lately. So we wanted to do something a little different there. Also put the fender radio on and the ROPS. We always do a, a new tractor every year for the toy farmer. So this year is a John Deere 3010. This is all new tooling. Uh, you know, we came out with a 3010 a long time ago. Um, I think before I was even with the company, we had a few issues with it in terms of engine inserts. If any of you remember that, we'll we'll try not to screw this one up again. Um, and then, last but not least, here in 16 scale, we're doing 116 scale Wagner tractors, the WA 17s and 14s. So this is kind of a a build to order uh, program. We, if, if we don't get enough quantities, then we don't tool it because these are obviously really expensive to tool. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did the big 116 scale John Deere combine. We were able to get enough orders to proceed with that. So we're still taking orders on the WA1714. John Deere dealers have until the end of May to get their orders in. And at that time, we'll see where we sit and if we got enough orders to you know to make it work we we have gotten orders for over 5,000 pieces so i think it's looking really good uh, but we'll continue to see there 
we will have a special announcement coming up this next week on something special with this tractor. So keep watching um, and you'll find out some more information there. In terms of 132nd scale, the one on the left here, the International Harvester 4786, this is the tractor we're doing for the National Farm Toy Museum in Dyersville, Iowa. We have this unit coming in for the Summer Farm Toy Show, which is the first uh, weekend in June. So if any of you are around, you might be able to pick one of those up here in Dyersville. By the way, we will have our showroom open for the summer show. So if you are in Dyersville, please come by our, our offices and you can come in and talk to me and the crew and see all these new items. I did talk about the Kloss Zerion 5000 that we're doing. So this is a, a pre-production sample of the 132nd scale. It does have the cab that rotates. Uh, it can rotate around so you can have it facing the back instead of the front. It's a, it's a really cool tractor. Um, we also have just come out with uh, a prestige version of the 8RX. I believe this is the 370 model. We had a 410, 410 model out last year. These have been really popular. Uh, another one is the Case 4894 tractor. We actually brought this out uh, under the Britain's brand first. So it's in Europe right now. And we'll also bring, be bringing out a version of this for North America under the Ertl brand. And then last but not least, we also have an 8R coming out. I believe this is a 370 as well. So an 8R, John Deere 8R, new 8R with front and rear duals. Down in 64 scale, uh, we'll be coming out later this year with an Alice Chalmers 7045 with rear duals. That'll be available um, out through our Ertl outlet store as well as our online through our Ertl Collectors Club. And we're also coming out with another co-op implements tractor. I believe this one is a Panther II. So that'll be coming out later this fall as well. So something a little different. We've also updated New Holland's latest T9 tractors. Um, they, New Holland updated their track offerings for their smart tracks models. So we're doing some tooling and updating that. Those will be out this summer. One of these will will be the uh, farm show unit for New Holland for this year. We do some implements as well. I had to put one in here. This is a Case IH 2150 planner. That's just shipping now. So it is out there if you're interested and you like 64 scale implements. And then I finished this page off with, again, the Toy Farmer 164 scale that we're doing, which is a John Deere 8960. So this is just a few of the models we have coming out. Typically, in, you know, in any one year, we'll come out with about 100 different models. Obviously, you know, that's lots of different scales as well as all of the different manufacturers. So between John Deere and New Holland and Case and all of the other brands that we have, trying to do those in multiple scales, um, it does, you know, it, we have a fairly wide selection of product available at any one time. I did want to touch on construction as well, because we do that in quite a few scales as well. Um, as you know, the big scale in construction, a lot of it is in 150th scale, but we do some additional scales as well. Uh, we do a lot of skid steers in 116th scale. We have a new Bobcat skid steer coming out in 116th scale. So I think you're gonna like that. It's a brand new series. We also have um, cat skid steers and we're working on some new ones there. So those will be coming out. And again, we have skid steers. You see the middle one there is New Holland. We also have Case and John Deere as well. In 132nd scale, we have some JCB items that we bring over from Europe. So we have a Lodal as well as some other models. We also do a Bobcat S series skid steer in 32nd scale that we put in with some of our uh, semis. This is the Freightliner semi that we have with the drop deck trailer. And then obviously our core 150 a scale where we do quite a bit of John Deere. We have both their construction and their forestry products. You can see the log skitter here and the backhoe loader. And then we're also just uh, coming out with some 
150th high detail case construction. So we've taken the excavator that we have and put some additional detail on it with the railings, the hydraulic hose detail. We also put um, the bucket with the thumb on it to give it a little more detail and something a little something a little extra there. So that you know that kind of gives you just a quick view of some of our product. Uh, also, just wanted to touch briefly on social media. Obviously, you're on this Zoom call, so you know how to get around with a computer. It's pretty easy to follow us. Um, we do have one person in our Dyersville office that's focused on our social media. Uh, her name is Michelle Wolf, and she handles our Ertl Facebook page as well as Instagram. So we have quite a few followers there and continuing to grow. I also do a monthly blog where I kind of talk about things that are happening to me in my personal life. And also then talk about some of the new products that we have coming out and try to give you a little more detail on some things. I also try to give you a little sneak peek every now and then on something that we haven't announced yet to the public. But it's so it's one good way to kind of see what, what's coming up. We've also, in the last few months, um, given highlights of some of the people on the team that, that make all these great toys. So you kind of get to see the whole team here in Dyersville that works on this product. If you do go to our website on ertl.com, you'll see our Ertl Collectors Club. It's free to join. Um, we also then let you, if you want, there's some special items that are for sale there. Um, so if you want to buy those, uh, it's, a, it's a good place to look and see. And if you do go to our website, you can see our latest flyers and catalogs there. We have everything posted. I do unboxing videos where I talk about the latest items we have coming out. I know a lot of collectors don't want to take the product out of the box um, because, uh, you know, it might not make it worth quite as much. But uh, I like taking them out of the box and looking them over. And that way I can also talk to you about the real unit and our toy and what we're doing with it. So, so I continue to do quite a few of those. You can also find my blog there as well. Um, and I think I'm up to blog number 44. So it's been out there a while now. And I do one roughly one a month. So uh, you can always go back and look at the old ones if you want. The other thing that's interesting, we've just, uh, we're just in the process of launching a new website called farmtoys.com. We're doing this in conjunction with Fat Brain Toys. We kind of wanted a place where we could have all kinds of farm toys. It's not just necessarily just from Ertl. So this is a website that's in, in process. You'll continue to see new things being added to it. But we just wanted a place where, where a customer or collector could go to kind of find a little bit of everything. So again, this is has just kind of launched. It's it's there's not a whole lot out there yet, but uh, it's a work in progress. So something to, to look at, and uh, we'll keep you updated in my blog and other information as we, as we continue to expand on that. So that's kind of the end of my presentation. Obviously, like I said at the beginning, we'll open it up for questions and comments. You are welcome to reach out to me. You can see my email and my work phone. Um, I can't guarantee that I'll always be at my desk if you call, but if you leave a, a message, I will try to get back to you. Um, some weeks are busier or better than others, but uh, but I'm happy to, you know, to talk to you and try to answer any questions or do anything that, uh, you know, that, that I can help you with. So that's pretty much it. Um, and we'll okay. open it up from here. No, oh, that's great, Bill. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah. Wonderful uh, rundown of uh, both Ertl and your products. My goodness, you look like a busy man. It, with, yeah, uh, it, it does keep me busy, yes. Yeah, you've uh, got a lot on the go. So how many are on the team at Tommy now that uh, look after farm toys? Um, our core team is around 15 people. So that includes uh, marketing, We've got four engineers. 
We've got graphics people, packaging, obviously social media, some design people as well uh, on the toy side. So yeah, it's and that's just in Dyersville. Obviously, we have we have more in Europe, Australia, um, Hong Kong, you name it. And are those people dedicated to um, farm toys only, or do they do the whole toy range? Uh, in in Dyersville, they are primarily focused on uh, on farm toys. Yes. Okay. Some of the other countries, they they do have some you know some other responsibilities as well. Okay, good. Um, well, if you want to uh, stop your slide sharing now, you bet. Uh, then we can see everybody's face and uh, we can hopefully uh, have some dialogue here. So uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions. If uh, somebody wants to uh, come on and push your space bar and uh, that turns on your microphone, ask Bill a question. Now is your chance. I would like to know, uh, do you build toys just from suggestions from uh, collectors or you go out on your own and decide on some stuff? Uh... Well, yeah, it's, it's really a combination. Uh, obviously, sometimes the manufacturers come to us and say, we'd really like you to, to build XYZ. That's primarily for the modern equipment, obviously, right? Because they're wanting to, you know, promote their latest and greatest. And they're the ones that, that know what they have coming out. So they have to kind of come tell us. On vintage, it's a whole nother matter. Obviously, you know, then we're working, whether it's the Toy Farmer or the Two Cylinder Club or another, you know, Red Power Roundup. Um, we'll work with them. There are some times when we just decide, hey, we actually, you know, we can do a project. We have, we have time. We have the, the tooling dollars available. Then it's a matter of okay, what you know, what should we do? What what haven't we done in the past? What's what are collectors looking for that we haven't done? So yeah, obviously you know when we have our shows in Dyersville, we have our booth open up, our showroom. We like to talk to people and say what's you know what what are you looking for? What what haven't we done? So. Well, I have a suggestion because obviously, I don't know if you can see on my screen, yeah. you see a lot of blue on the wall. I do see a lot of blue. And I would like to see uh, like a 7,000 in a row crop. I'm going to hold up a, a dealer brochure. Okay. Like, so here's the high crop. Okay. And the first Ford tractor my dad bought was a 7,000, but it was the uh, standard uh, model. Okay. And... I took a 4,000 body and I turned it into a, a 7,000. Okay, okay. So to get, to get something to remember by him. But uh, right. I do really like the high crop one and that would be nice to see in a 116 scale. Okay, very good. I, I grew up on Ford tractors and Alice Chalmers tractors. That's what my dad had. So yeah, but those both, you know, are a little closer to my heart. Bill, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on your uh, induction last fall to the National uh, Toy Hall of Fame uh, at, there at the museum. So congratulations, well done. A uh, couple questions and comments. Um, any consideration being given to 16th scale case tractors and precision and prestige? Uh, there's never been like a 770 or an 870 done. Uh, models. Uh, one of the most often asked for two-cylinder models I've heard over the years and, and still would be an unstyled version of the John Deere AR. Of course, Ertl did the styled AR, but uh, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, serious John Deere two-cylinder collectors and and toy hobbyists are looking for an unstyled version. That's the low seat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And um, I imagine, do you still see 32nd scale growing in interest? And my last quick comment, Big Farm, is um, is that a true 16th scale version? Over we, yep, we, when we do Big Farm item, we try to make that as close to 16th scale as we can. Okay. Since, since it is made as a toy scale, 
we do sometimes have to beef up some areas to make sure it can, you know, take the beating from kids. So we do a lot more toy testing on those to make sure that, that it'll kind of withstand the, the abuse. But yes, for the most part, those are true scales. Have you ever considered making uh, more of the W series from the McCormick Daring, like a W6 or a W4 or an I? There have been a total of 127,000 of them made in the real world, whereas there's only been 23,000 of the 88 series, that, you know, the, the latest ones. Right. Yeah, obviously we did those W9s a long time ago, even kind of when I, before I was there. We've talked several times about doing a W6 or W4, and it seems like every time we've wanted to do it, it, it something else took priority and we just never got it done. So I do have, I, I keep a, a long list of items that I'd like to do, and we kind of you know, <coughs> keep looking at them every year. I actually had a W6 on that list here. It's, it's on my list right now. So I would like to do that at some point. Um, it's just a matter of when and how. Well, I think too, and Bill, you can maybe expound on this a bit. Um, a couple other things that enter in what you can choose to do or not in terms of the business feasibility. And, and that is, uh, first of all, uh, Frank just mentioned that often the number of original real tractors sold is, is something that you take into consideration because, uh, the predict, uh, to prediction of future sales often is, is uh, predicted by, based on how many real tractors were, were made and sold. And the second thing is, uh, if you're going to make a W4 or a W6, uh, you really don't have any uh, other models that you can make from those guys. And, and uh, those of us who've been involved in the, this business for a while know that, you know, if you can take a die and uh, by changing a little bit of uh, front end work or by making it a narrow from a wide front end or something, if you can get four or five models from one die by minor changes, that's a more feasible way to go for the investment in a die. And I don't, I don't know if some of the collectors realize the money that you put into those dies, but it's, it's pretty high. Yeah, you know, one of the things I, I've actually been doing some research on the W6 and, you know, you can look at a W6, a, a Super W6, the W6TA. Um, there are some uh, engine changes, obviously, as well. So that's, you're right. That's exactly what we look at, how many versions we can do and what kind of quantity we think we can do overall. So like you said, uh, you know, doing a 116 scale tractor, even a vintage one, you're probably talking $80,000 on up to tool it. And so then you have to be able to project enough volume and enough sales dollars off of that to, to pay off the tooling. So any other questions of Bill while we have them? Now is your chance. I wonder about the uh, about the, the International 74 Series. It uh, There never was a toy built. It morphed into the 84 Series. And when Case IH merged, they were into the 95 Series. It was also an international like a, a global uh, tractor, it's sold in Europe and in Japan as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it ran for about a good 25 years or so. And, uh, but a toy was never produced. I was wondering if that's on uh, anywhere on the horizon or potentially could make your list at some point. I, I think, you know, in terms of tooling, as you just spoke, you probably get a lot of mileage out of a 674 or 574, change the grill, then you go to the next type of series. I'm just wondering if that's mm -hmm. uh, an option for you guys down the road. Um, uh I believe some European manufacturers have done some of these, so I'd have to take a look at that. Um, I think they've been primarily done in 30-second scale. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking 116th, I'm sorry. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Um, yeah, we just haven't spent a lot of time on that. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've written it down here, and I'll take a look at it. Thanks. You bet. I have a question for you, Bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kind of more regarding about the uh, the pickup truck license licenses you guys have for sure. Ram and GM and all them. I heard that there's in the uh, collect and play series, just like these old Fords, mm -hmm. that there's some new Ram trucks coming out. I didn't know if that was true or not. That is in true. Or scale. Yes. 
So the, the trucks that we do, even though we put them on the collect and play rack, they are still 164 scale. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got an, a new 2020 Ram 3500 Dually. Mm -hmm. We also have a Silverado coming. And we also did the F new Ford Ranger. So we oh. have three new trucks coming this year. Yep. Oh. I just wanted to make sure if that was true. And I've seen some stuff yeah. online. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we just got some samples in this last week into the office. So, yeah, I'll, and, I'll try to get some info out on those. Uh, but, and another question, on, on those Ram trucks, will they have a, a like a fifth wheel hole in the bed? Yes. Yeah? Yes, they will. Yep. Just wanted to ask that. So. See, what, what, one of the interesting things uh, is that Case IH and New Holland are owned by Fiat. Well, Fiat hmm. also owns Ram and Chrysler. Okay, yeah. So if we want to do a set that includes a pickup truck with something Case IH or New Holland, we have to use a Ram truck. Yeah, that's they, true. They won't let us use a Ford or a Chevy. So yeah. it's interesting. It, it, you know, it, it makes, for, makes for some fun conversations sometimes about we yeah. want to do this or that. We got to have the right truck. So Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. You bet. Bill, has there been any uh, discussion about the uh, – Cockshot 30. Uh, 2022 is the 75th anniversary of the production of that tractor, and that's the uh, that's the introduction of live power takeoff, which one of the, was one of the major uh, innovations in tractors uh, in in history. And uh, just wondered if anybody had any discussions with you about that. I I don't know if you can do anything from the uh, the uh, toy show sets uh, if they're close to the 30 or not. Unfortunately, that tooling is really can't be used anymore. So we would have to we would have to do new tooling. But that's interesting. I I didn't pick up on that anniversary. Typically, I do a lot of research on anniversaries of tractors, and obviously, an anniversary gives us a reason to do it and and do some special models. So let me take a look at that. I I can also reach out to my contact at Agco and see what's going on with it. So thank you, I appreciate that. Looking at your licensing, uh, when you had it up there, I noticed Alice Chalmers was separate from Agco. Yes. Why is that? A Agco did not buy the rights to Alice Chalmers. Just when, gleaner, probably. Just, just the gleaner side. And by that time, so Alice Chalmers, if you remember, was bought by Deutz. Yeah. So for a while there, it was Deutz Alice with the with the green tractors, yeah. and then Deutz so was that part got sold off to Agco, but they never bought the rights to Alice Chalmers. So we have to go, we had to go get a separate license agreement with uh, the company that now owns Alice Chalmers. We actually worked with a gentleman in Norway on the licensing for Alice Chalmers. Cool. Thank you. You bet. Bill, I wanted to add my congratulations on being inducted into the Hall of Fame. I'm sorry I missed the induction. Usually Rick and Eldon and I are, are, at, uh, are at the country club there doing those things, but yep. uh, you were a very deserved candidate. Well, thank you. You'd, for the tooling of your models, do you do that in Dyersville or where is that usually done? So, so our so the engineers we have in Dyersville work all of that up, but then it's actually sent to our Hong Kong office. And they're actually tooled over there uh, because that's obviously where most of the manufacturing is. Uh, but then the tooling model comes back to Dyersville. We go through it all. We make any changes. We still have a tool shop in Dyersville. So if we need to make any changes to the tooling model, we do all of that in Dyersville, and then when we send it back to Hong Kong, it's ready to, you know, to, to go into the tooling process and go from there. A lot of it is computer generated anymore, isn't it? Uh, the, definitely the modern items that we tool, yeah, I mean, we get the, you know, we get the computer engineering files, whether a lot of it is through um, a program called Pro-E. So we get a lot of Pro-E files from the manufacturers and they can use that to do the tooling models. So yeah, it's it's getting more 
computerized all the time. It's just, you know, it's one thing to get the file. It's another to take all that information and figure out how, how we're going to make every part because we obviously want to make it as efficient as we can. If, say, on a Magnum tractor, we know the chassis is black, but the hoods and the cab roofs and the fenders are red, can we make those parts separate so that we don't have to, you know, paint something one color and mask it off and try to paint a second color? So we're trying to, to do it as efficiently as we can to save on all the other assembly and painting and all of those things we have to do as well. Well, my final comment is another, uh, another to suggest, to support the W6. Okay. I grew up in the prairies of Western Canada before I migrated to the United States and the W6 was by far the most popular tractor on the prairies. Okay. Uh, and uh, you could, you not only could do the W6, but you could do the WD6. Sure and the Super yep. 6 and yep. the TA model. So there yep. could be some possi possibility of different versions. Yeah, we just, uh, you know, that's one thing to try to find all of those in Iowa is a little more difficult um, just because we didn't have so many of them around here, but yeah, absolutely. One of the best sources of those, there's a uh, museum in Leesburg, I Florida. Mm. Uh, it was featured in, I think, some of the international magazines. And he's probably got one of the best collections, most complete collections of, of international tractors. And his restorations are just superb. Wow. OK. So they, they'd be, they'd be uh, easy to take pictures from and, and work from there. Sure. OK. I would echo the W6. Uh, I would say with a lot of the international toy collectors we worked with over the years, that's one of the most asked models as well. So I, I guess I'm just echoing uh, encouragement too, like the others you've heard tonight, no pressure. No, uh, Bill, no pressure. Bill, uh, yeah, Bill, a quick question on pedal tractors. Uh, yeah. Obviously, uh, Tommy Ertl's big in them. Do you see more growing interest in pedal tractors? Uh, what what do you hear from collectors? Uh, they looking for more, and or, or what do you see? What do you envision? Um, I, you know, we've had we've had some interesting times with pedal tractors. We were making pedal tractors in in China out of uh, aluminum, and then the government changed some of the regulations where, with the number of the amount of lead that can be in pedal tractors. So then we. That's when we kind of switched to our stamp steel units. Now we've kind of, now we're back to kind of making a combination of stamp steel with die cast hoods. So I think those have went over well. Um, the, you know, the, the models that we've done, whether it's the vintage or the modern, obviously we've got the latest John Deere big 8R and the Case Magnum, and we've also done some vintage ones. Um, uh, sales seem to be pretty good on those. We're, we're going to, we're going to be introducing some special pedal tractors. We kind of wanted to make some that that are a little nicer. Obviously, the ones we make are still made for kids to, to pedal on, right, and use. So we want to make ones that are a little more what we would call collectible. So we're, we're in the process of tooling some die-cast seats, die-cast steering wheels, die-cast front axles. Uh, we want to do something, you know, a little, a little different, a little nicer. So you'll be seeing... Some information on that later this year. Those are planned to be out next year in 2022. Great. Yep. Question for you, Bill. Uh, our country's relationship with China has been a little rocky at times with tariffs and things like that. How has that impacted your work? And uh, what do you see in the future? Are most of these toys still going to be made in China? You know, it, it it's something that obviously we've got to we've got to think about and talk about. Um, we have in the last couple of years moved some product out of China and actually went to Vietnam with some of it. With Tomi being a global company, they also have some factories in other locations as well. There's a Tomi factory in Thailand. I believe there's someone uh, there's one in Indonesia. So there's, there's always 
um, discussions on what makes sense long term. Um, you know, the, the the one of the big points is the the cost of labor. You know, uh, zinc is the same price globally. Oil is the same place, same price globally. A lot of the materials, it doesn't make a difference essentially where they're at. Uh, they're all going to be the same price, but it's the cost of labor that's that's a big input, especially with some of the items we do where you'd have, you know, over 100 parts uh, for assembly or painting or whatever, um, you know, lab labor is still important. So that's an ongoing discussion. Um, yeah, who knows what's going to happen between our countries and China. So we need to kind of have, you know, I spent some time in the military and you always had to have plan B, right? <laughs> and, if, <laughs> and if that didn't work, plan C. So we're always trying to come up with uh, with our plan Bs and plan Cs to figure out what, you know, where we need to go next. One more question for you, Bill. Sure. Uh, take an example like that uh, IH you did for the Red Power Roundup. I recognize mm -hmm. that if there's a lot of tooling that, you know, you can pick up from other things. Sure. Is there some kind of quantity that you need for uh, a project like that to make it feasible? Well, so, so we don't necessarily make all of our products in our own factories. We do use a lot of third-party factories. So when we go to do a 116 scale tractor, we typically have to make at least a minimum of 2,500 pieces of that. When you get down to 164 scale, it's it's more it's typically 5,000 pieces. So you know we we do need to look at you know okay if we're doing this for the Red Power Roundup, are they going to take 2,500 pieces? If not, then we you know if if they don't want to, well, number one you have to go to Case IH and get approval to do it. Um, and then if Red Power Roundup wants to take 500 pieces or so, then what are we going to do with the other 2,000? Then it's, you know, becomes we offer those to the Case IH dealer network, right? So that's always something we're looking at. You know, we have to admit our minimum production quantities and kind of where are all those going to go. And then obviously that, you know, if we do have to do new tooling, then we really need to look out. Typically, we look at trying to pay back tooling in three years. So can we sell enough volume based upon what it's going to cost to tool it? And again, that varies with every project, right? So then it's just a matter of how much is the tooling cost? How much are we going to, how much volume are we going to have to sell to pay off the tooling? And we kind of, we've been doing this long enough. We kind of know what we're going to be able to sell it for. <laughs> So it's just a matter of putting everything in a spreadsheet and, and, and getting the quantity at the end. Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, well, any uh, last questions before we wrap up, folks? Uh, I got one, Doug. Uh, go ahead. Um, go, Chris. Say 164th scale uh, implements. Any sign of, uh, say, bigger implements for the higher horsepower tractors? Um, well, you know, we've done a couple air seeders over the years. We've tried to do some of the bigger tillage equipment. Is there something special that you were looking for? or? Um. Well, yeah, I realize you got the, the big air seeders, maybe some bigger planters, um, okay. the cultivators. I know there's, I know there's uh, customs and stuff like that, but sure. And and maybe some more uh, the prestige series. Yep, we'll be working on that. Obviously, um, you know, I, I know Speccast did some really big John Deere planters, those DB series planters. So, um, so you know, we've looked at what we can do there and, and uh, yeah, it's implements are always interesting. You know, when, when we look at our sales tractors far outsell implements. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just because implements are a little more regional. Um, you know, 
uh, now a planner I think is fairly common, but there are some other other implements that are more regional depending upon what crops you're using. So we always have to kind of uh, look really hard and make sure we're going to be able to to sell the implements as well as maybe put them in a set um, and go that route to get some more volume out of them. But yep, we're we're always looking at implements. It's just a matter of what makes the most sense. Great. Good. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. Okay. Well, uh, Bill, it's uh, certainly been a great presentation that you've done here. And then uh, I think a lot of our uh, collectors will be surprised that there's way more to the behind the scenes uh, activities that go on in producing farm toys at, uh, at Ertl and Tommy. And uh, uh, as I said earlier, you've been a really busy man based on what you've shared with us here tonight. So uh, we do appreciate you taking your personal time to join us. And uh, I know that uh, ertl has got a uh, high reputation in the farm toy world and everybody appreciates uh, what you're doing and what you're producing. And uh, I'm sure everybody also really appreciates that you've been very open and willing to uh, discuss uh, toys, uh, get feedback from the collectors, and uh, who knows, one of these days uh, they may see that toy that they asked for, but they got to wait 10 to 18 months, I suppose. But uh, thanks again so much. Uh, we've had a really good turnout here tonight, and uh, likely one of our best turnouts ever, actually. So uh, that's uh, a tribute to you. And again, yes, as, as um, a couple others have mentioned, I want to echo my congratulations to you as well for the Hall of Fame honor, uh, well deserved and good for you. And uh, we will look forward to uh, seeing you on down the Toy Collector Road when we can meet in person. Sounds great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to actually being able to go to some shows and talk to talk to some people live. It, it's been it's been a quite an interesting year. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll call it a night. Uh, and great to see such a turnout. So uh, keep smiling and keep safe from COVID. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Doug. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thanks.